the antidote. 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 You're listening to the antidote with Dave Hawkins. With Christian music that doesn't suck.
I'm Dave Hawkins, and The Antidote is back with more Christian music that doesn't suck. We've had a couple weeks of metal. Tonight, I'm going to slow down the pace. You heard our opening song, Dust, from the new Insomniac Folklore album, Everything Will Burn. The band has been around since 2001, creating what Wikipedia has described as goth rock, gypsy punk, folk punk, dark cabaret, and steampunk. That description really boils down to me in that Insomniac Folklore's music is more than different. And it's brilliant. At a music festival this summer, I sat down with band members Tyler and Adrian for a chat about their new album and what the music is all about. It's a pleasure to meet with the members of the world's most unusual band, Insomniac Folklore. And we have Adrian and Tyler here with us. Guys, good to have you. Oh, well, thanks for having us. Yeah, most unusual band. It's quite the introduction. <laughs> well, you know, I was only really half joking with that introduction. Wouldn't you think it's legitimate describing your music as unusual? I, I'll take that. Really, just over the years, I've tried to pull in elements just to keep it interesting. We're kind of inspired by, by bands like Danielson Family and some of those groups and just wanted to take the visual aspects a little further. We, we really like to interact with people. And I'll, I'll take unusual. Is that just your personality coming through or is it that you really do want to shake people up? Well, um, when I'm performing it's really just kind of a louder version of my persona and the entire project Insomniac Folklore is really just the louder version of me or like the internal version of me getting to come out. I mean, I think there's a lot of value in putting on an interesting show and something that people don't see every day. Uh, it's, it's, it's healthy to get shaken up a bit. Right, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I have to give you the truth here. When I first heard the music of Insomniac Folklore a few years ago, you know, I just didn't get it. I didn't understand it. <laughs> yeah, you, you definitely wouldn't be the first. Um, actually, just this weekend here... Um, there's a few people who've come up and talked to me who's like, I thought you guys were weird or I hated your band for years. And then I finally took the time to listen to it and look at what you were saying. And now some of these people are saying that we're one of our favorite acts. So that's I know, kind of a slow burn for some people. I, maybe, really we're sweet, an, when maybe we're an acquired taste. Yeah, it's very <laughs> sweet of them to, to come up and tell me that. Like, I hated you guys. Ah. <laughs> No, I mean, you definitely um, get some interesting reactions from people. For me, that's really interesting, too. I don't know, if you're doing something that's not really offensive, but it's just weird, and it kind of, but it agitates people because they don't understand it, I think that that's interesting, and it kind of, I hope, in some ways, makes people think about, okay, well, why is this upsetting? Or maybe at least I like to think about that because it's interesting to me. <laughs> well, wine may be a mocker and beer may be a brawler, but we are all fools. Wine may be a mocker and beer may be a brawler, but we are all fools. It's useless. be a bard, you might be a lawyer, we all have it hard, and what does all this mean anyways, what does it mean in the end? It's useless, useless, all of this is useless, it's useless,
greatest of plans I laid them all down so carefully But what does all this mean anyways? What does it mean in the end? It's In 2011, Insomniac Folklore released the album A Place Where Runaways Are Not Alone, which included that track, Useless. The band began long before that album, and that comes up on the next part of our talk. Obviously, Insomniac Folklore has then been agitating people for a long time. <laughs> and you had a big cast of characters coming into the uh -huh. band. How, giving us a short story of how this began. Okay. I'll, I'll try to keep it fairly short, but uh, the project really started in Roseburg, Oregon. Um, I was just kind of started writing songs to help the, pass the time when I wasn't sleeping that well for a while, and uh, then I kind of just got some friends together that were better musicians than me at the time um, out in the Roseburg area to back me and played with them for a while. And every time I've moved, I think I've uh, kind of put together a different band. And some of the people, even though I've moved, are still in the band. And uh, Yeah, we'll do some uh, long distance recordings or we'll play with people when we're in town. And like, it keeps it, it's a family. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, it's a large extended family. We have members who still play with us today in Portland, Oregon and uh, St. Louis, Missouri. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're kind of all over the place now, so we have, like, a bunch of part-time band members, essentially. Well, you were talking about how uh, your performance style evolved, and I think it was really an interesting thing, and this is before I was in the group, but you just playing around in southern Oregon, that's a very, like, industrial kind of logging area. That's just a lot of people would just listen to metal music all the time. And, and Tyler and a couple of his other friends would be just playing like acoustic folk style music at metal shows. And so I think a lot of the theatricality sort of evolved in that scene of trying to get attention. Yeah, I, I took, kind of took it as a personal challenge to kind of right. meet the uh, energy and engagement of some of the metal and punk acts I was playing with, but just from a different angle. Yeah. Growing up in that area kind of was very influential, or uh, at least <laughs> shaping. Yeah. Well, I'll see other other artists from the same area too, and then we'll all have a similar level of of engagement and activity. There's some kind of like thread of the performance quality that joins everyone together there. <laughs> it's very interesting. <laughs> Your original music is really quite different from what you're doing now. Oh, you, you've heard it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it really started off being um, maybe a little more in the vein of like Simon and Garfunkel or uh, and like Violet Films kind of meshed together. Um, as it would just started off me and, a, and an acoustic guitar for several years, and I was still trying to find my voice uh, quite literally because uh, the people I was listening to at the time sang higher, and I didn't know what my singing voice was even yet. You're hardly high, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah, but but I tried to sing higher for years. Um, I think trying to sing higher than my natural range, even when I was younger, it was still lower than, my talking voice was lower than my singing voice. And then one day I uh, decided to try tuning my guitar down a step, and actually that changed everything. I found that, oh, I can, if I just tune my guitar down a little bit, I can sing in a more comfortable range just because my guitar playing was really a, a little more limited early on. It, it improved over time, but um, after a while I was more able to take what I was hearing in my head as far as a song would go and translate that to an actual song and be able to sing that in a comfortable range. That very different style comes out on this older track from Insomniac Folklore. Here's Sunflower Eyes. Beautiful. 
It is in the eye of a beholder And the only one who is looking is me Maybe if you weren't so darn pretty Maybe I could stand a chance Skies are blue. I don't know when my life concludes, but I had these feelings for you. Fireflies dance in her eyes, lay in the grass. Skies are blue I don't know when Life concludes But I have these feelings for you I don't know why the skies are blue and I don't know when my life concludes but I have these feelings for you Sunflower eyes Sunflower eyes Sunflower eyes Well, I found it interesting when I was online and I found that you are listed as the Reverend Tyler Henschel. Now, I'm not going to try to discount faith or anything else, but is that serious? Um, yeah, I guess uh, I guess I actually am a, a Reverend. I have a certificate and all. Um, I uh, don't know how seriously I take that aspect of it. It's more just kind of part of my character, but it's also a legal title I, I can perform weddings and all that stuff so <laughs> and no one's ever tried to tell you that you're a heretic oh I've, I'm sure someone has over the years um there's been some people who have been upset about what we do from various angles um I, I don't know if I've heard the word heretic but there's definitely been some people who just did not understand what we were doing or thought that we were evil for whatever reason, but... <laughs> well, then, let's carry on with that, then. Is okay. insomniac folklore preaching a message? Um, I don't know that I can say insomniac folklore is preaching a message, necessarily. I feel like we're um, upfront about what we are and who we are, and we try to handle things in a sincere way, and... but. I, with a certain amount of gentleness as well. Uh, yeah, I, I think that preaching is not necessarily the right term, but right. Uh, we really just kind of want to talk about who we are and what we think through our art, and that's, I think, what anyone who makes art is trying to do is communicate something inside and present it, you know, in a tangible way in whatever medium, and that's just what we do, and we try to keep it kind of a... Uh, just be honest and be consistent, kind of regardless of who we're performing for. So. I mean, there's definitely a spiritual aspect in our art and what we produce and what we make, and we hope that people connect to that as much as they're ready for. I was just doing that to try to torment you a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, we Canadians have this really weird, sort of facetious, sarcastic kind of humor. <laughs> Thank you.
Hi, this is Adrienne. And Tyler of Insomniac Folklore, and you've got The, the Antidote. Antidote. Bestow your blessings on bastards. Oh. If you can make the prostitute lovely, oh Lord, then what can you do in me? Fire sharpens iron. Then we might have a problem. Oh, cause bullshit don't make things sharp. Lord, oh Lord, oh how I need you, oh. Oh Lord, oh Lord, oh how I need you. What can you do in me? What can you do in me? Truly no one is worthy And the least of which is me I deserve Human rights, these rights I have, human rights are death, hell, and the grave. I deserve death, hell, and the grave. Oh Lord, oh Lord, oh how I need you. Oh Lord, oh Lord, oh how I need you. My heart is dark and scarred. is dark, dark as a tomb, you can resurrect these bones, you can bring peace to my soul. Lord, oh Lord, oh how I need you. Oh Lord, oh Lord, oh how I need you. Say, what can you do in me? Oh, what can you do? in me My heart is a whore My body corrupted My soul longs for thee
What could you do in me? What can you do in me? Something I find that stands out with insomniac folklore are the lyrics. I mean, on the surface here, you have light, cute little tunes like cell phone gives you brain cancer. <laughs> and then you switch things around and with trying to grasp reality on the following track, photographic evidence of a normal life. Are you really hunting for that kind of dichotomy? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if I had to look for it. Um, but... Oh, sometimes we present really sincere, heartfelt things underneath just a little bit of... Spunk? Oh. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's it. Oh, some things I just do because I, I personally think they're funny. Um, I, right. I really like to use... Uh, I've used satire from time to time. But, oh, yeah, I, I do kind of like to walk that line between... Uh, not to say that any of it's necessarily insincere but but why should you take yourself too seriously there's so much weight and difficult things in the world but that's something we all just have to live with and that the juxtaposition of that it just with absurd situations in in reality is you know an irony that we all have to live with and so you might as well appreciate it right <laughs> So the absurdity, like adding Wallace the singing sheep <laughs> to the band. Well, we were doing a lot of really brash and absurd kind of songs at the time. And, you know, we had a sheep that is like, dude, I want to be in this band. And it seems like a good idea at the time. But frankly... Man, there's a reason more bands don't have sheep in them. They, you, they get in a band, they become the most popular member really quickly. And then it just goes to their head. And now he's talking about trying to start a solo project. It's very, it's ridiculous. <laughs> but yeah, in, including the sheep is just really something that we just thought, oh, this will be ridiculous. Right. <laughs> That'll be hilarious. And it, I, I feel like it's gotten slightly out of control. And you have to cuddle the sheep the entire time you're on stage. <laughs> yeah. And, Animals, He's remarkably you know, clingy. Yeah. He's clingy and <laughs> sweaty and warm. I, I mean, <laughs> it's like it's worse than having like a cat or a dog in the band because it's covered in wool. <laughs> I don't think it's possible to have a song shorter than that. Cell phones give you brain cancer. Also from the simply titled LP by Insomniac Folklore comes photographic evidence of a normal life. Here comes a G chord. Okay. Be ready, okay. sucker. Shut up. <laughs> Say 
say you're to play. I went to many movies. I immersed myself in fiction. I don't have to think So I don't Insomniac Folklore has a lot of music out there, and now you've just added the newest, Everything Will Burn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's a change from your past releases. I mean, you know, it still has all the fun as your other music does, but it's obviously, it's more serious. Is this a sign that you're maturing? Well, I hope I'm maturing. Um, but really with this one, I feel we had a very kind of specific goal for it. And so with a lot of our other albums, we just kind of have recorded all the songs that we write during a certain time period, more or less, and there might be a theme through it. But this one here, we just really wanted to kind of address a lot of the... Uh, now, there's a, there's a lot of fear and distrust in the world today, and uh, we just kind of wanted to address that in a really straightforward, less silly way, but also, I don't know, I, I hope present some uh, some hope in that. You know, it's been a few years since our last one, so this, yeah, just presented as a more mature album talking about the times we're in now. And I don't know if it will stay that way in the future. We're pretty open. <laughs> It's a topic that has been coming up in film and in books a lot in the past few years. 
an apocalyptic age. Oh, yeah. I think that's something that's in the air right now. People just have a feeling of that. And it was sort of something that we wanted to tap into as well. Just as Tyler was saying, there was so much anxiety regarding... I don't know, politics, climate change. Um, we were in the West Coast during the drought the last few years, and it was it was heartbreaking to watch all of that. Yeah, all the water reservoirs drying up and the forests on fire. I mean, it was just strange times. Yeah, but, uh, and so I think that we're living in sort of scary times right now, and I think if you were able to sort of reference times of similar upheaval in the past and even pull in some of this apocalyptic literature from the Bible that's talking about things that could happen in the future, but maybe that can give people a sense of meaning and hope and courage through that. This is going to come across as sounding harsh. Are you guys just trying to cash in on a current trend? Well, I, I, I don't think it will make us any any <laughs> any more money. Um, right. But um, I don't know. I I personally am starting to find the a lot of the kind of apocalyptic themed films anyway is getting a little tired. I think that they're kind of starting to miss the miss the mark and just kind of be more and more sensational. Mm-hmm. So this one I wanted to kind of ground it a little more in reality. Um, I don't know, would, would we do better if we did like a kids album of silly songs on it? I, I, I don't I really don't know. know. <laughs> but, uh, it's a fair question. Right, but I mean, as far as like selling out or cashing in or whatever, I, where's the money? <laughs> yeah. Show it to me. No, no danger of that. No, we're, we're in no danger of that. The title track, Everything Will Burn from Insomniac Folklore.
is nigh. Oh, burning fires, carried by rushing winds. All things are born. talk about our current age and a bit of a taste of reality but you know one of the references for everything will burn are the writings of Emmanuel Velikovsky yeah. yeah he's called a historical revisionist but really you could almost really describe him as wanting to reinvent history uh -huh. why was he important to the release well we had already been talking about writing an album that was exploring the themes of Moses and the apocalypse one of our friends gave us this book, and it was about the apocalypse happening during the Exodus. And so it fit so perfectly with the themes that we were already sort of exploring. And I think it, it allows you to see that whole story in a new way, and I feel like a more human way. I think it's very interesting that a lot of people find the Old Testament a little bit too chaotic, a little bit too violent, and it puts them off. As, as if contemporary judgments of an ancient holy book could be possibly relevant. Um, but I just found it so fascinating that when you are reading the story in a more literal way, and it's even more chaotic and more violent than you ever would have thought to understand it, it also makes more sense and the characters take on a more human quality. And, and that was just really fascinating to me. I think just looking at a story from a different angle is always valuable. You talk about the human aspect. Uh -huh. How does it make it more human when you have a song entitled Moses with Horns? Oh, really the whole horned Moses thing comes from a... Well, it's it's not a not not anything we came up with. It's actually something that goes into uh, art history and several translations of a Bible for uh, hundreds of years in Europe, uh, due to the understanding of a of a single Hebrew word that can either mean a shining or a ray or a point or a horn, and so uh, and they're all equally valid translations. So of course we're used to the idea of Moses coming down from a mountain and glowing. Um, or shining, but uh, there's been many translations of that same passage. It says, Moses came down from a mountain, and from the skin of his forehead were horns. And everyone says, oh, cover that up, man. And they, you know. Um, well, but even that is, it's a physical thing. It's not just something that's in your mind. It's a reality that you have to confront and deal with. You know, if, if someone had actual horns as opposed to just, you know, a spiritual glow in their aura, that's something that you can't ignore. Well, you couldn't ignore it either way. No, you that, couldn't but... ignore it either way, but I think for some reason in our kind of 
contemporary Western minds, we're more comfortable with the idea of him glowing. For some reason. I don't even know I think why. it's just what we're used to. It's what we're used to, but... Um, if you grew up in Germany a few hundred years ago, you would just kind of expect that Moses had horns, and the right. idea of him shining would probably be confusing. Yeah, but I feel like just taking things to... to in a, Just looking at the physical aspects of the story, but also everybody being in a situation that's over their heads. The chaos and the sort of violence that's described putting something on a such a more massive scale but a scale that you can imagine it it makes it more relatable i feel because you can then imagine the reactions that you would have in that situation I find it interesting with Everything Will Burn, you use these musical interludes between songs with the vocals. How does that change the narrative? Well, I use those um, basically during the time we were writing and recording the record. There is these, uh, in some circles, a lot of talk about, oh, the, uh, the four blood moons and... Uh, a testament you know, to how long it took us to get this album yeah, made. Yeah, this album took a long time to make, but the time we were uh, writing and recording the bulk of it, there's a lot of talk about that in some circles, and I just thought that I, I don't know how much stock I put into the significance of the, of the uh, Tetrad over Four Blood Moons. I, I think it's interesting, but I just uh, kind of wanted to, since... They were viewing that as something that was significant for the nation of Israel, and I, I'm not discounting that either. Because they each fell on a either. Jewish holiday that, in that yeah. cycle. It was a Passover and then Sukkot, then Passover and Sukkot, which were all important Jewish festivals historically. Um, 
I just thought that was interesting, so I just did V4 musical interludes to kind of bookend kind of a time that we were making the album during, and then all of that led straight into our elections here, of course, in the United States. And, um, you know, we're just a lot, a lot of unease during this time, and I think that we are in a time of uh, significance and change now, regardless of what that has to do with, you know, any of that. I don't know, but I, I think it's at least an interesting coincidence. So we, we took a lot of, yeah, like the Horn Moses and the Tetrad. I'd be like, these are interesting ideas to play with. You know, we can do things to represent this because it all seemed to kind of be tying together as we were working on this. Effectively, then, the album itself is really trying to be a reflection on today's society, today's culture, or is it bringing it from the past also? It, well, it's. I think we're just... Well, yeah, a lot of elements of Moses and the Exodus, but we're really using a lot of imagery from that to kind of frame the time we're in now. Um, it's almost like the apocalyptic Moses in America. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's a little goofy. And that's going to be a new movie idea. <laughs> a new movie. Yeah, Mo Moses and the Apocalypse, the, the next great sci-fi thriller uh, coming to you soon. <laughs> well, okay, we talk about culture. Insomniac Folklore lists its home as being Portland, Oregon, the center for the counterculture of America. <laughs> Would you consider yourself part of the counterculture? Well, uh, since we're certainly not part of the dominant culture so much, I, I think by default, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I would say that's pretty fair. <laughs> We've been here with Tyler and Adrian of Insomniac Folklore. Guys, thanks so much for coming for this talk. I really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, thank, you. Yeah, thank you so much. It was fun. <laughs>
fountains What treasure lies in these deeps Corroded These veins once filled with salt Yet still it beats my sacred heart My face, rest of the carpet, and the gun, the back of my head. Before darkness, my wife is gonna miss me. Will I see teeth spread across the floor? Say for everything a reason. Not every reason dwells in time. As the comets and bombs rain upon the earth, we will know how great thou art. Thou art. It may come from the earth, it may come from the sky, it won't.